Well, good morning, Faith Arlington Online. We are so excited that you are joining in with us today. Hey, if you're a guest, we just wanna say welcome to the Faith Arlington family. If you have any questions at all about our church, please visit our website at fbachurch.org or call our church office. We would love to talk with you and answer any questions that you may have. Here in a few moments, we're gonna hear an incredible message from our lead pastor. But before we do, here are some ways that you can stay connected to Faith Arlington. Text the phone number 43506 by using the keyword updates. Text updates to 43506 and this will sign you up for automatic text updates of all things Faith Arlington. Be sure to check out our Faith Arlington Facebook page and our Faith Arlington Instagram account. To see what all's going on within our student ministry and our children's ministry, head over to the Faith Arlington Children's Ministry Facebook page and the Vive Facebook page and the Vive Instagram. Let's lean in as we get ready to hear a word from our lead pastor. Well, amen. Thank you, Greg and worship team. Let's give God a hand. Amen. Yes. Hey, if you have your Bibles today, and I hope you do, let's go ahead and meet in the Gospel of John. John chapter 11 is where we'll be today. John chapter 11. And while you're finding your place and your copy of God's Word, I just want to say, man, it's great to see you today. We're grateful that you chose to worship with us. We realize and recognize there's many places you could have gone for worship, but you landed here. And for that, we're so, so grateful and pray that you'll be blessed by our time together. I do want to say, Anna Grace Federal, so, so proud of you. Listen, going through those waters of believers' baptism, so proud of her and so proud of Hannah Horner uh, going through the waters, the first service. So can I, can I just say there's something about having a baptism in a public school, amen? Man, that's some good stuff. I'm telling you, I love it, love it, love it. I'm so proud of you guys. Hey, I want to give you also an update on the church. So you guys know that um, we gave an update last week, and I want to give another update this week. Here it is. Are you ready? We'll be in the new facility 2021. Okay, it's, it's still the same, still the same. I, I, here, here's what happened. So if you want to blame somebody, here's exactly what happened. Last week I got up, and, and it's not really normal for me, but I was very politically correct and said, hey, we're not going to give a date. We've given too many dates and frustrated people and myself, and I'm a little bitter and angry and need counseling and all that kind of stuff. And, and I said, hey, basically, here's where we are. We're, we're not going to give a date. We'll be in there sometime this year. And then David Smith got up at the very end and go, no, we're going to be in next Sunday. So when you see David Smith, please, like, get him in a headlock for me, and we'll be okay. It's his fault. Got to blame somebody, right? We got to blame somebody. But all can decide, the inside of the church, I believe, is finished. Uh, we need a road to get put in this week, and then, man, I, I'm not even going to say it. But if I were going to say something, maybe next weekend, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. John chapter 11, you there, Sam? I'm there. There we go. All right. Hey, listen, um, we're in the middle of a mini-series that we have entitled Simply a Word for the Year. If you've been around Faith Arlington for any time, you know that every year we kind of throw out a word, and that's our word and theme for the year. And so we're walking through a series uh, with that word as our title, and the word is Arise. And we, to support that word, we have used Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 4, and it supports the word for us this year in Arise. If you are with us last week, our first sermon of the sermon series, we looked at Luke chapter 7, and we talked about arising from doubt. Anybody ever doubt? I, I believe that's one thing we have in common. If you have breath in your lung and you're here today, I believe all of us have had an area in our life some, at some point or another that where we've doubted. And we looked at the text and that of one of the greatest forerunners found in the Word of God, and be John the Baptist. He preached for 30 years, the, repent and be baptized, one of the greatest preachers of all time. And we see it's at the end of his life and so, so John the Baptist would be in a, in a dungeon, in a jail cell, in a prison, about to be beheaded by uh, uh, King Herod. And, and so we know that he's there. Time is short. And what does John do? We found out last week that he doubted. He sent two of his closest buddies and said, hey, guys, can you go find Jesus? And when you find him, can you ask him one more time for me? Is he really the Messiah or should we be looking for someone else? And so we took that text and we pulled some principles for it. And when we doubt... And if we live long enough, we will doubt. We have a plan of how we walk through that doubt. Well, today, we're going to continue that sermon series, and we're going to look at the text this morning, John chapter 11. We're going to pull principles from that on how we arise from disappointments. So the question is this morning, have you ever been disappointed? We have a staff meeting every Tuesday, so we're sitting around our staff table, and everybody was there, and I, I told, hey, listen, guys, I'm going to preach on John chapter 11, disappointments, and I, I, don't, I just kind of threw that out there for a moment, and 
I thought that ought to be easy to find illustrations this week. And all of a sudden, my phone was on the table, and it, it had, a, had a ring to it. And I looked down, I had a text from one of our staff members, and that of David Smith. So I'm going to pick on him this morning. And look at this picture. Here's what he sent me. You like that? 2020, you see that? I'm like, thank you, David. I have enough of my life to be disappointed about, not to show that we should have been in there a year ago. Are you, are you with me? Can I just tell you this today? Maybe you missed that. Can I tell you this today? Hey, he, here's the reality. It, it don't matter where we're worshiping as long as we're worshiping, right? Listen, we'll get in that building on God's time. That's what I'm supposed to say spiritually, right? We'll get in that building on God's time. It's going to be great. Hopefully next week is what it is. But here we go. All right, John chapter 11 is where we're going to be. We're going to look at this. And, and if you've been around church for any uh, um, uh, time at all, you know that this is the chapter. These are the, the texts that we find this morning where Jesus would, would resurrect one of his best friends in that of Lazarus. Now, this was an incredible miracle, but some of the detail behind the miracle I think it's worthy to note today is this. This would be the last miracle that Jesus would perform on planet Earth before he went to the cross. It would be two short weeks later, and Jesus would go to the cross, and he would die for your sins and for my sin, and then he would resurrect on the third day. And so we know that that's about to happen in two short weeks. It would be the last earthly miracle that Jesus would perform. It's also a very public miracle. We know kind of interesting about this miracle is it would foreshadow what's coming in two weeks. But another interesting fact about this miracle is if you were to look in all the Gospels, you'll find in all the Gospels, the only Gospel that recorded this account would be the Gospel of John. And you ask the question, I think it's worthy to ask, well, why was it not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, here's what many people believe. This miracle that happened was a very public miracle. It was a very high-profile miracle. And this miracle demanded a response. And so when Jesus would resurrect his best friend from the dead, you either believed that he was the Messiah and you would follow him, or you believed that he was not the Messiah and it fired you up. And so, so historians and scholars and theologians would tell us that people were after Jesus after this miracle was performed to kill him. And so many historians would tell you as well, when, when Matthew, Mark, and Luke were pinning the words and giving the Jesus story, Lazarus was still alive. And so many people would go, listen, the reason that it's not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is for Jesus and Lazarus' protection. Does that make sense? And so John said, hey, I'm, I'm putting it in here. I think it's worthy to note. And so that's what we're going to look at today of this miracle in John chapter 11. Just go a little bit deeper. When the rubber meets the road today, John chapter 11, we're going to look at disappointments in life. How do we arise above disappointments in life? Can I ask you a deeper question? Have you ever been disappointed in God? I believe if we're all to be honest with us today, we may not admit it in a small circle or a small group or home group, but, but maybe in our hearts today, your first answer was yes. I feel like God's let me down. Can I just tell you that if you walk this journey long enough, God's going to disappoint you. People's going to disappoint you. When that happens, what do we do? How do we arise above our disappointments? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to journey that through John chapter 11. Before we do, let's pray together, church. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for the incredible privilege and honor we have to look at your word. And Father, we pray today that as we look at the life of Jesus and Lazarus, God, would you speak to our hearts today like never before? God, would you remove all distractions? And God, would you speak to us today? And Father, our prayer as always, as we leave this place, may we be forever changed for your good and your glory. We love you. We commit this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, John chapter 11, looking at verse uh, 1 and 2. Let's dive right in. We have a lot to cover. Uh, the first service now, they didn't listen fast enough, and we were a little bit late. So we'll, you guys listen a lot faster, and we'll, we'll get through. All right, John chapter 1 and 2, here we go. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now here's what we need to know. At this point, we know there's three people in the story. It was Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They were all brother and sister. Lazarus and Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha were all really good friends. And we understand that there was a, there was a very, very close relationship. We learn from the text, and we learn from many uh, historians, that Lazarus was probably a very prominent man, a very wealthy man. And so when Jesus would pass through Bethany, or in that close to Jerusalem, he would stop and he would stay over at Lazarus' house. We know that. We know that from the, the story of Mary anointing his feet with, with the oil. And so we understand that the insider in that of Lazarus was sick and he was dying. Can I tell you, I, I don't know about you, but if it's at the end of my life and I don't feel like my life is quite yet over and you have a health issue, there's probably disappointment in that of Lazarus, right, that we pick up in the text. Just in the first two verses, look at verse 3. 
Verse 3 says this. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now this is interesting to me and it's kind of a Christian karma, so to speak, and we're guilty of this as well. Maybe you're not, I am. She, she's saying, hey, Martha's going, hey, listen, can you get word to Jesus? Jesus, listen, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. Here's what we do sometimes. Maybe today, and you're here, and I'm glad you're here. She invited you, or he invited you, and you came, and we're honored that you chose to worship with us. But some of you may be here today and go, listen, Jesus, I'm here. Hey, it's supposed to be 73 degrees and sunny today, and it's 1030, and I'm here. Are you watching? Because later this week, I may need something from you. Hey, Jesus, there's two white boxes at the door, and you know what? I'm probably going to give a little bit today. And I hope you see me give because later on, you know right now our light bill's due and money's kind of tight. We do that sometimes, and we find this is exactly what Martha's doing. Listen, you kind of, I, I scratch your back, Jesus, you scratch mine. Jesus, the one you love, Lazarus, he is, he is sick. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, here's what I want to press in just for a moment. It is for the glory of God. Now, this is kind of a churchy statement. Have you ever been around someone who's, you know, you, you hear that, oh, man, praise God, glory God. You kind of go, that's kind of churchy. That's kind of a religious statement. What does it actually mean for the glory of God? Can I tell you what it means? Here's what it means. Jesus is going, listen, this is for the glory of God. The glory of God means this. We want to see God in his full attributes. We're going to see everything he is. We're going to see everything who he is through this miracle. It's not about me. And so basically Jesus is going, hey, listen, Martha, it's not about me. It's not even about Lazarus at this point. It's about bringing God glory. And we're going to see that's exactly what he does. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, which would be Mary, and Lazarus. So let's pause there just for a moment. We have religious groups today who would say this, hey, if you believe enough, if you have enough faith, if you come to church enough, if you love Jesus enough, you're never going to be disappointed. You're never going to have doubts. You're never going to have frustrations. You're never going to have hard times. Can I tell you, that's the furthest thing from the truth. In this, in this text, it's saying, hey, listen, Jesus loved these three people. I would say this, I would, I would step out on a limb and say this, there's probably not three more people in this text on planet earth during this time that Jesus loved more than Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So we need to understand it's in this time, listen, it, not, it does not matter how much we love Jesus if, if bad, bad things are going to happen. The Bible says in this life you will have trouble. Now I know that will bless you this morning. But we know that Jesus is right there with them. We're going to see what he does in this text. I want you to kind of Photoshop that in your brain. We'll go back to that in just a moment because how we deal with disappointments in our life are very, very important. We see that Mary and Martha, really, really Martha, Mary as well, we're going to see later in the text, both begin to play the blame game. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, I would say this. It's interesting here. They get word to Jesus, go, hey, your best friend. The one you love, he's sick. And the Bible says Jesus dropped everything he's doing and ran to Bethany, ran to Jerusalem. No. What does it say? It says he stayed two more days. It seems like there's a, there's a delay there, right? It seems like there's an intentional wait there. Well, it is. Maybe you're thinking, maybe my Bible has a typo. What was Jesus doing? This was his best friend. No. This is exactly what Jesus did. So if you're taking notes on your app or your listener guide or a white sheet of paper, here, here's what we said. Number one, if you're taking notes, we said this, arise, we arise above our disappointments when we learn to wait, when we learn to wait. They got word to Jesus, and the Bible says he stayed two days longer where he was. Now, I don't expect an amen on this because this is a tough one, but listen, if you're going to arise above disappointments, you're going to have to learn to wait. Now, can I just be very transparent with you just for a moment? I do not like to wait. I'm, I'm type A. I don't have any patience. I get that. Hey, about two months ago, we went to a lacrosse game. My youngest son, Cody, plays lacrosse, and we went to Nashville. And the coach said, hey, listen, y'all need to get, it's on a Saturday, y'all need to get here about two hours early. I'm like, two hours early? Are you kidding me? I started fussing already. <laughs> two hours to do what? I mean, you guys are going to be worn out by the game time. We left two hours early. We, I, I was obedient just for a minute, so we got in the car. We left early that morning. We get to the Tennessee River, and it took two hours and 18 minutes, I'm not exaggerating, to go 20 miles. By the time, five and a half hours to get to Nashville. Now, that will bless you, right? 
We get to Nashville, and man, nobody in my family liked me. They, every one of them, Dad, you were just grouchy. I'm like, no, I just, I just don't like to wait. This drives me crazy. What, what, what about this? I, may, I'm catching up with the times, and my kids showed me this the other day. And you, you may know this already, but just, just bear with me. Did you know that you can turn TV on and you can watch an old, like an old show, like at 918? It don't have to be on TV. Did you know that? It's called on demand. Do you know? No, you guys know that, right? Nobody. Well, let me let me introduce you to it. My kids just showed me, so I can sit down and watch a TV show. It's incredible. Anytime I want to. And so I, I sat down there and went, man, this is amazing. And half the time, you can hit the fast forward button and you can go through the commercials. It, it's life changing. I'm telling you, it is life changing. I sat down the other day watching a show and I went, okay. And I hit fast forward and a little thing came up and said, not available on this content or whatever, this show. And I went, are you kidding me? I threw a fit. Well, I'm not watching if I got to watch the commercials. I've gotten there already. Are you, are you, I cannot even watch a commercial anymore. Are you, listen, I hate to wait. What, what about you? Listen, if we're going to expect, if we're going to rise above our disappointments, we have to learn to expect and learn to wait. This is exactly what happened. Hey, I, there, there's different theology in church. Can I just say that? I, maybe you, don't get mad at me. Maybe you said this. I've said this, and I've had people say this to me. Have you ever heard this when you're, when you're waiting? When you're having intentional delays from the Lord in your life, and people say this, well, God is just trying to teach you one more time, God is trying to teach you, man, do you, that's, so, that's poor theology. And, and there may be times that God is trying to teach you patience. But can I tell you, in this story, when they're waiting two more days, it has nothing to do with patience. Mary and Martha, it had nothing to do with Mary and Martha. It had nothing to do with even Lazarus dying, but it had everything to do with Jesus foreshadowing in just two weeks that he would die on a cross, and on the third day he would rise again. And so that's what he's, hey, listen, I want to get this in right now. This is what we're doing. So when we go through a delay, maybe it's not about God trying to teach us patience. Maybe it's about God trying to reveal his plan. And those are two radically different things. And that's what we see out of Martha's life. So we have to expect some delays in our life. And as a pastor, can I just tell you some of the most frustrating areas of my life of expecting delays or maybe times in my life when, when, when I feel like God is right there with me. Man, I open my Bible and he's just pouring out. Maybe we're worshiping, it's right there. I'm, I'm tracking with you, God's speaking to me. I open my Bible, he's speaking to me. Everything seems to be going... There we go. Everything seems to be going well. And, and so now, and maybe there's times in your life where you open your Bible and you feel like God's so distant from you. You're worshiping, going, man, I don't even know what's happening right now. God, I need you to, you seem so far away. Maybe for some of you right now, that's where we find you. Maybe for others, it's a, it's a relational delay. Maybe you met him about a year ago, and you already had in your mind, he's the one. We're going to live in the house with a white picket fence and have five kids. It's incredible. And this weekend, he broke up with you. It, it, it didn't end like you thought it was going to end. Maybe for others of you, maybe there's, it's just a professional delay. Maybe you thought, man, I'm going to be, I should be in management by this time. And Friday, I got the pink slip. And you're asking the question, God, where are you? Or, or maybe for some of you others, maybe it's a, it, it's a you, you fill in the blank of the delay. And, and you're asking the question today. You came in this morning with a heavy heart going, man, this is me. Disappointment is me. God, where are you? Can I tell you, in order to rise above our disappointments, we must learn, and it's a must, that we will have delays in our life. And we have to learn to wait. And for me, that's hard. That is so difficult. We play the short game. We live in a culture of instant gratification. No commercials, but God grow me. And it's in those times of waiting, normally God does grow you. So if you're taking notes, number one, to rise above our disappointments, we have to learn to wait. Number two, to rise above our disappointments, happen when we value God's glory over our gains. When we value God's glory over our gains. Now, this is really hard. This is a difficult one. Can you think right now of a circumstance or situation where life really radically affected you? And in that moment, can you ask the question, was it for my gain or God's glory? We said earlier, listen, in order to glorify God, it means that his full attributes are revealed in our life. And can I just tell you that, that many times for us, when we, when we focus just on, on me, on me, on me, can I give you a little hint? Listen, your calling in life, my calling in life, everything we do, what God has called us to do is to glorify the Father. 
That, that's what we're supposed to do. But half the time in my life, I, I, it's about me. It's my gain. It's selfish reasons. It's all about Brian. Listen, I know, God, I'm going to glorify you later, but can you get me through this valley now? It's hurting. Remember, I don't like to wait. But it's not about our gain. It's about God's glory. And we're going to see that. When you look at verse 4 again, let's read it again. It says, but when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not end in death. It is for the glory of God. Now, now what does that mean? Can I tell you that God's glory, when we start thinking that way, when we start thinking kingdom-minded, can I just tell you the score is different? Have you ever, have you ever played a game with a kid and, and they, they score differently than you do? Anybody? Listen, to me, confession is good for the soul. When, when our kids are, I, I'm a competitive guy. I, I, I'm competitive, and I will die a competitive man. So don't email me and tell me it's a sin. I know it's a sin. I just, I'm working on it. I can't help it. You can ask my kids, if I were to die today and we had our funeral, you can say, hey, listen, your dad, can you give me three of his favorite statements? One of their favorite statements would be this. Dad taught us you have to learn to lose before you learn to win. And so that being said, man, I'll never let my kids win. They'd be two years old, we'd be playing checkers, and I'd beat them. And I'd get up like I just won the World Series of Checker. Yeah, get some of that. And Cody, Cody played basketball growing up. We'd always play out front. We had a goal out front, and, and he was like five, and at the time I'm probably 30, 30, however old. And we'd be out front, and I'd be beating him five to nothing. You know how that goes? And then he would, he would make some crazy shot, and he would score. And he goes, okay, it's eight to five. And I go, wait a minute. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's five to one. He goes, no, it's eight to five. I made it over there, and that's worth eight points. Changing the rule. He keeps score different. And I would get mad, and Melinda would come out and go, Brian, are you serious? He's five years old. I'm like, no, you got to learn to lose before you learn to win. Now, this is important. It's just theology right here. And so, so that, listen, have you, have you ever done that? Can I tell you this? Listen, the score that you keep and the score that God keeps are radically different. And one of the reasons we get so disappointed in this life is because we hadn't grasped that concept yet. God keeps score radically different. It's about him and his glory. It has nothing to do with our gain. It's not about that. I want to give you two truths, and I promise I'm going to move on. But listen, here's truth number one. There are some things that God can demonstrate about himself to the world through your personal struggle or pain better than he can any other way. So maybe right now you're going through a major disappointment. It's a struggle. It's a valley. And maybe right now God's going, listen, through your struggle and your pain, you're going to grow, so there's going to be some gain through that. But understand it's really about my glory. And the way people are watching you right now really determines how people respond. Listen, when everything's on point in your life and your finances are on point, your marriage is on point, your kids' relationships on point, your work is on point, listen, it's easy to give God glory and walk through that. And people don't really watch during that time. But, man, you go through a death, you go through a relational struggle, you go through your kids kind of going through a crazy season, and you know what happens? People lean in and watch. And it's in the midst of that that, it, yes, you'll learn from it. Yes, you'll gain from it. But it's more about God's glory. Does that make sense? And that's what we find in this text. So, so here's a question. To arise above our disappointments, we understand we have to give God glory. So here's a question. Many times we ask the question of this, God, why me? You ever ask that? God, why me? Why me? And I believe this is what Martha's doing. God, listen, why me? You, you love us, you love my sister, you love my brother. Why us? Why me that my brother's dying? But it's in that moment that we need to ask the question, and this is not natural or not normal, but it's with the Holy Spirit of God in and through us that we can ask the question, God, how? God, how can I glorify you? God, I want to do that. How can I glorify you? All right, look, let's, let's do this. Let's skip some verses because you guys aren't listening fast enough. Ver, let's skip down to verse 17. Let's get down to verse 17. So we see what's happened up until this point. We see that they told Jesus, he said two days later he would come. Look at verse 17. So Jesus comes. It says, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days. Now, four days, I believe, is intentional. We understood that it took two days for him to wait, and then he went. Maybe it took a day to get there, a day for him to travel. But, but here's the thing, four days. I believe that's intentional by this. Listen, Lazarus was good and dead. There's no, remember we said this was a public high-profile miracle? There's no question that, hey, maybe he took a long nap. Maybe he was unconscious. For four days, we understand Lazarus was dead. Look at verse 18. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Now, let me pause there just for a moment. This makes the story even crazier. Listen, Jerusalem was the uh, uh, epicenter, religious epicenter, right? And it said it was two miles off. Can I, can I give you that in today's case? You guys know 5959, our old location? 
That's probably about two miles. It was a 30-minute walk. When, Je- when they told Jesus two days, he could have walked 30 minutes, he could have been there. But the Bible says he didn't. So they just tell us again, it was four days. He was giving us some details. And we also understand that it was only about a two-mile, 30-minute walk for him to get there. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, which was Lazarus' death. Now understand this, back in this time in the culture, the funerals were about seven days. So we told you this was a high-profile uh, miracle. We understand that Lazarus was a very wealthy, prominent man in Bethany there. And so a lot of people would have come to the, the, the funeral, right? So the funeral is seven days. So we're four days into a seven-day funeral, and everybody's there. Everybody's consoling Martha. Everybody's consoling Mary. And then verse 20 happens. It says, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Let's stop there for a minute. Now, what did Martha do? Both of these ladies are sisters of Lazarus. Both of these ladies are disappointed. Martha responds differently. She runs out to meet Jesus. Mary responds differently. She stays in the house. But they're both disappointed. Their responses are differently, but they're both, uh, respond, they're, they're both doubt, disappointments are the same. Jesus, listen, what happened? Where are we going? She makes a beeline to meet him. Look at verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Do you know exactly what she's saying? Martha's going, listen, I'm playing the blame game. Jesus, it's your fault. My brother died. If you'd have been here, that wouldn't have happened. We have to blame somebody, right? She's saying, hey, I'm disappointed. Ultimately, she's saying this, Jesus, I want you to know this, and I'm going to say this publicly. I'm disappointed in you. Because if you would have been here, we understand that you could have healed Lazarus and he would not have died. Look at verse 22 through 23. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, now, it's almost as if Martha didn't even hear it. Jesus goes, hey, hey, Martha, listen, Lazarus, he's going to rise again. Can I tell you what's happened? And I'm afraid the church has gotten here some. Martha had the Sunday school answer. Martha had been to church. She'd been taught in Awanas and all that growing up in Sunday school. And now she's going, listen, I know he'll rise again, Jesus. I know that. I know there's coming a thing to where I learn in church when I get super old and, and I, ended up, I ended up dying. And there's going to be a day where Jesus come back and, and the resurrection is going to happen. And he's going to raise all of us from the dead. Jesus, I know that. I know that. And, and so she thought she knew. And it's almost as if she didn't even hear. But what, what really was Jesus saying? What was he saying? Let's look at verse 26 or 25. But before we do, look at this. I wanted you to take this last note. We know to arise above our disappointments, we've got to learn to wait. We have to see the value of God's glory over our gain. And lastly, number three, if we arise above our disappointments, when we realize resurrection is not an event, but a person. Oh, this is good. It's not an event, but a person. Where do we get that from? Look at verse 25. So let's back up to 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's he's right in Martha's face going, Martha, listen, you don't understand. Yes, there's coming a a rapture one day. Yes, there's coming a resurrection one day. and, And we'll call all those home who die. But I'm telling you, I am the resurrection it's not only an event. Listen, I, we know this as believers. We know the Bible says in Corinthians, to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. I believe with all of my heart for the believer, when you breathe your last breath, the Bible says your next breath is face-to-face with Jesus himself. And praise God for that. But all, Did you guys hear that? There, there we go. Make sure you're with me. But, but Jesus is also going, but listen, I am the resurrection. I, I am the resurrection. I'm the life. He goes, do, do you believe that? We know that he's asking that question. Look at verse 26. Verse 26 says, And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So he's asking the hard question. Listen, in two weeks, Martha, I'm going to the cross. And because of that, I'm going to take care of this enemy right now, that this, this sin and death, and I'm going to conquer that. So anyone who believes in me shall live for, for eternity. Look at verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. I believe she knew in her head, but did she really and truly know that in her heart? Look at verse 28 and 29. When she said this, 
she went and called her sister Mary, who sang in private. The teacher's here. He's calling for you. Look at verse 29. And when she heard it, Mary rose quickly and went to him. Hey, we said this earlier. What was Mary doing? Mary was disappointed, but she was staying at the house. Can you imagine that day? We're having a funeral for her brother. I can kind of see Martha being a little bit spastic. Anybody know a Martha? Don't point, don't raise your hand. Some of you are shaking your head no, or you could be maybe the Mar- Mar- Martha, maybe, some of you, no. Mary sitting in the corner. Jesus is here. You want to go see him? No, I think I'll stay right here. Disappointment. Disappointment. And then Martha comes back and goes, hey, Mary, he wants to see you. And I listen, I don't have anything else for you if this doesn't make you fall in love with Jesus even more. Hey, go get her. She comes back. Can you imagine Jesus? You know I was disappointed in you. You know I was frustrated with you. If you would have been here, listen, my brother wouldn't have died. So Jesus is showing her grace and mercy. He sees her and he loves her. Man, that's a good word for us this morning. Look at verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Now now here's where it gets interesting for me. Why had Jesus not gone into Bethany yet? Because Martha was there. Again, she stopped him. Hey, listen, Jesus, she wouldn't even let him in. He's, and this is just me. I'm just thinking out loud. Do you not think that Jesus would go, Martha, if you just get out of the way in about 10 minutes, I'm going to raise your brother from the dead. If, I mean, I, you, just, you know he's thinking that. Like, can you just get out of the way and let this miracle happen? You're, you're stopping it. You're stopping it from happening. Look at verse 31. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, this is Mary, consoling her, and saw that Mary rose quickly to go out, they followed her, surpri- uh, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. We said this earlier, it's a seven-day funeral, right? She's weeping. They thought the Jews that were with her thought, well, she's going to the graveside again. Let's go and console her and love on her. They had no clue that she was going and making her way to Jesus. Look at verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell to his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, here we go again. What is she doing? She's doing the same thing Martha did. She's blaming him. Jesus, listen, if you would have been here, I'm telling you publicly, I'm disappointed in you. But if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died, and I'm blaming you for that. And again, Jesus responds in a way that only Jesus can, and this makes me love him that much more. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, the Bible says he, Jesus, was deeply moved in spirit, and greatly troubled. If you write in your Bibles, I encourage you to do so. Would you underline that? That'll be something I think that means a lot to us in just a moment. Jesus was deeply moved and deeply troubled when he saw what was happening. Let's look at verse 34. And when he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the famous verse, verse 35, many of you can quote because the Bible drill points easy. You're with me? Shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty-five. 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Hey, can I just ask you a question? Why, why, would, why would Jesus weep? I've had a lot of people ask, hey, in this story, why would Jesus weep? He knew that he was about to bring Lazarus back from the dead. Why would he weep? You know what I believe with all my heart? I believe in all my heart that sometimes we don't need a theological answer. We just need the presence of Jesus to weep with us. Can I tell you in this passage, Jesus is not only weeping with Mary and Martha, but he's working in Mary and Martha. He's working in their life. And we're going to see that. Can I just tell you today, listen, wherever you are in your disappointments, maybe you're weeping. Did you know that Jesus is weeping with you? Not only is he weeping with you, he is working with you. Look at verse 36. The Jews said, see how he loved him? Again, see how he loved his best friend? But some of them said, could he not have opened the eyes of the blind man also, kept this man from dying? And they're going, hey, they're asking a legit question. Hey, listen, you guys know, what did Jesus do last week when John sent word for him? Hey, are you really the Messiah? The Bible said he kept performing miracles. It's in this fact, listen, Jesus is going, hey, if he can heal the blind and he can heal the sick and he can cast out demons, could he not have prevented his best friend from dying? They're they're asking a, a good question. Look at verse 38. Then Jesus, would you underline this again, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone laid against it. Hey, can I do this for a moment, guys? I need you to lean in. Ladies, you can listen for free, but men, listen to me. I didn't learn this in church. I didn't learn this about Jesus in church, but I love it. 
when you look at it, it says that Jesus was, he was deeply moved. We don't have an English word that adequately, adequately uh, correct the, the Greek word. So when it says deeply moved, it was our weak attempt to, to write down the original Greek language of what Jesus was doing when we said deeply moved. The more accurate, listen me and listen to me, the more accurate word for that would be snorted. Jesus snorted as if he was a charging bull. He was fired up. Man, that, that fires me up as a man. I, I want to see a Jesus like that. We, we think when well, he was deeply troubled, he was wringing his hands like, what do I do? He was weeping. He was soft. No, Jesus was fired up. He was snorting like a bull about to charge. Why? Because in two short weeks, he would finish it forever. Can I tell you that Jesus has never lost a battle? And I'm not trying to degrade this, but he is the undisputed, uh, undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. He is, and he's never lost a battle. Although we get disappointed and we lose battles, he hasn't. And he's in charge of this. And when he was deeply moved, he was troubled. Look at verse 39. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead for four days. Bless Martha's heart. I mean, she just can't help it. Can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine going there? And, and I can just see her going, yep, 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 the whole way. Jesus walking to the tomb. Here's Martha. Yip, 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 yip. And he goes, hey, can, can somebody go take that tomb? He's going to stink. Thanks, Martha. He's a dead man, been dead for four days. Thanks, Martha. That's, that's a lot of theology there. And then for John to record, it's even better, right? So we see that happen. Look at verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe that you would see the glory of God? There it is again. Verse 41. So he took away the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you have sent me. Oh, this is so good. Jesus standing around. He's going to heal Lazarus. Hey, listen, this is, going, this is what's going to take place. Father, thank you for what you're about to do. And then he would say this. Listen, I, I know that you hear me all the time, and I know that you're powerful to do that. Remember, he's never lost a battle. But I, I'm really saying all this and praying this out loud for these people. Why would he be doing that? What, what was our point? Because God's glory is more important than our gain. And so he's giving glory to the Father once again. Look at verse 43. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Why did he say Lazarus, come out? I believe if he didn't, every corpse on planet Earth would have come out of a tomb. I believe that. That's the power of Jesus. Lazarus, come out. He had to be specific. And then lastly, closing out verse 44. And the man who had died came out, and his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped in clothes. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Hey, here's a question I have for you, and I promise you I'm done. If Jesus had the power to raise Lazarus from the dead, to come out of a tomb, do not think he had the power to unwrap his grave clothes. Why in the world would Jesus go, hey, listen, y'all see him standing at the door? Can somebody go unwrap him? You know what I believe with all my heart? Jesus could have done it, but he wanted to use somebody. Hey, can I tell you today, the challenge is still there. Jesus, listen, Jesus don't need Faith Arlington. Jesus definitely don't need me, but he chooses to use us if we see fit. Can I tell you, I want to be the church he uses. I want to be the broken, sinful, healed, forgiven man that he uses. That's who I want to be. What about you? Hey, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. I want to ask the worship team to come on up. We're done. We want to have a time of response, but with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask a few questions for you today. I believe with all my heart that there's some people here today that may be disappointed. And can I tell you, in the midst of that disappointment, you have two choices. You can either turn and run, run from your faith, run from the church, run from your faithful friends, or you can do battle. And the battle that you do is from a place of victory. Because remember, Jesus has never lost a battle. And maybe for you today, would you think of that disappointment? Let, let's take a minute to do that. 
Would you get whatever you're disappointed about? Some of you didn't have to think long. Others may have to. But would you get that disappointment right now, what's driving you crazy, and would you put it in your heart? You got it? Wonder what would happen right now with your head bowed, your eye closed. You see that disappointment. What would happen if Jesus walked up to you right now and he bent down and he looked you in the face with tears in his eyes and he said, listen, I got you. You've got that disappointment. Would you give it to me? What would happen? Well, can I serve notice upon you this morning? That's what's happening spiritually. Jesus loves you. The Bible says he weeps over you. The Bible says he works in and through you. Would you get that disappointment this morning? And would you give it to him? He's weeping right there with you. Some of them are heavy. Hey, I got a diagnosis this week. Hey, I'm losing a family member this week. I'm disappointed. Hey, there's more month than money in my account. Disappointment. Hey, I thought marriage would be easy. We've been married 30 years and it's tough. Disappointment. Would you call a timeout with tears down your face? Would you look at Jesus? And would you understand that he's weeping with you and for you? And the Bible says he loves you. Would you give him that disappointment today? The Bible says, come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Some of you today need rest. Would you give it to him? My problem is I give it to him and then I take it right back up. Would you give it to him and leave it there? Hey, maybe for others of you today, you need to be obedient and follow through with believer's baptism. Hey, we have a portable baptistry here. The water's warm. Maybe your baptism's out of, out of order. And maybe today you're convicted by, you need to be baptized. What do we do? You can make your way down front. We'll baptize you today. We'll make that happen right now. Maybe you need a church to call home. Today, during this time to respond, would you make your way down and say, I want to join the church? Maybe today you've never called upon the name of the Lord. You know, man, I, I, I hear this Jesus you're talking about, but I really just don't know him. Maybe you know him in your head. Today, would you know him in your heart? I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to stand and sing. It's in that moment, would you respond to whatever God's dealing with you about? Father God, thank you for today. Father, thank you for the promises in your word. Thank you for the story, the miracle of Lazarus. And God, we pray today that you would take our disappointments. God, would you teach us that it's all about you and your glory. And God, that can be hard. But God, we commit this time to you. We pray that you would move mightily. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in today. We pray this message was a huge blessing to you. If you have any questions at all, or if you simply made a decision to accept Jesus today, we would love to hear about that. So please give us a call to church office or check out our website for all the staff's emails. We would love to hear from you and answer any question that you may have. We wanna thank you so much for being faithful in your giving. If you haven't had the chance or you're unaware of the ways that you can give to Faith Arlington, all you have to do is visit our website at fbachurch.org to give online or simply give us a phone call at the church office and you can either mail a check or drop it by. On behalf of Faith Arlington staff, we just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in and we hope to see you again next week.